So this is really exciting. Um, we never do, we hardly ever do video interviews, and it's been years since we've done this. And uh, we're actually doing two at the summit this year. Um, the one you'll see tomorrow is with Dr. Nancy Snyderman from NBC, who just got home from Liberia and is under a 21-day quarantine. She got home last night, and uh, she's in her home in New Jersey, and she's going to be talking with us. And um, today, we have Megan Smith, who is a longtime friend of the Most Powerful Women's Summit, has been coming to this event live and in person for years. Uh, she's a longtime executive and star, rising star she was at Google. And uh, her last job, she was in charge of Google X, the sort of next generation develop development lab. And um, Megan um, is a rock star who President Obama recognized as just that. And a couple of weeks ago, he named her America's new chief technology officer. So I'm going to move over here. And we are going to get Megan on the line through of course, Google Hangout. <laughs> and um, so over the years, uh, Megan has contributed to so many engineering pro pro projects, ranging from a bicycle lock to a space station. And her board service and advisory roles include MIT, where she is a double, t double triple grad, uh, BS and master's degree in mechanical engineering, and she has a degree, an advanced degree, uh, at MIT's ma uh, Media Lab. And uh, she's also been deeply involved in Vital Voices, the Malala Fund. She has gen generously mentored over the years um, uh, through uh, with our uh, most powerful women global uh, mentoring program that we um, that we do with the State Department, and she and Kathy Lutton and Susan Wojcicki have been co-mentors, and Megan Smith, America's new Chief Technology Officer. Welcome. Thank you. Hello. It's great to be here, Patty. Thanks for allowing me to be here digitally. I guess it is a, a digital thing that I'm doing. Megan, thank you so much for making this work today. We wish you were live, but this is sort of a cool way to talk to you as America's new CTO. So this is your first interview, actually, isn't it? It is my first interview. And so tell us, how did you get this job? Um, it actually happened pretty quickly. Uh, I was actually in Africa. I was in Uganda this summer working with fabulous entrepreneurs there and got the White House team reached out to me and I guess I was on a short list of a bunch of people they wanted to come in and talk. Uh, I stopped in Washington on my way and that kept turning into a callback, a callback, a callback and 33 days later um, I was asked to join the administration. So it's been amazing. Did quick vetting and we got here uh, in time for kids to start school. So fast track. So how were, you, how were you actually officially asked? Uh, I had a phone call from the president, which was amazing. And I said, uh, he asked me to join, and I said it would be an honor. So Megan, what, is this, what does this job really involve? Um, you know, the idea of the CTO, it's actually a new role. Uh, the president started it on his first day of his administration uh, in the beginning, first term. And the idea is, to have someone and the team, how do you help advise the president and his team on how to unleash the power of technology, data, and innovation on behalf of this nation? So it's it's an architectural job, and what we're doing is working across government, whether it's, it's within this government, things like open data and helping um, open the government to more collaborative things like Anne Wojcicki was talking about, or whether it's bringing talent in um, and thinking about uh, how to get out of the way of top innovators. Um, work on big data, et cetera. So a whole range of different projects, whether they're pilot or whether they're um, things like the Presidential Innovation Fellows, bringing top talent into the government. We have 27 new fellows who joined uh, about two weeks ago. So are you involved in solving problems such as making sure that a healthcare.org-like launch doesn't ever happen again? Yeah, you know, I think in some ways that the healthcare.gov site is a good example of why you're starting to see more technical people uh, coming into the government in this way. Um, I think the experience of a website potential really 
uh, hurting the amazing legislative agenda and the legacy there um, was something that woke people up. And Mikey Dickerson and several others have joined in working to structure uh, the government so that we can help with all the different websites and just improve the quality of them. We want them to work like those in the private sector. We have an extraordinary technical team within this government already, and so bringing in additional leaders to help them build great websites uh, that can really, um, Americans really expect to interact with our government digitally, and we wanna be great at doing that. So our job is, is more an advisory job. We help spin up which is, what is now the USDS, US Digital Services, which is embedded in OMB and the 18F team, which now has extraordinary front end, back end, user interface, great technical talent that's flowing into government. Um, and actually located not only here in DC, but also in San Francisco, Chicago, all across the country. And Megan, what about uh, reaching out, helping communities across America become more digital, more sophisticated, faster? Yeah, so one of the things that I thought, when, you know, I'm new, I'm one month in, so, you know, I'm learning many of the different initiatives that everybody has in place, but there's an extraordinary amount of programs that are place-based that are reaching into communities, upgrading our community colleges, and, and work. Dr. Biden and the Vice President have been doing a lot of that work together with, with the President's team. Um, so part of this that I saw, there's, there's some great research from uh, Enrico Moretti from UC Berkeley, who talks about the brain hubs, which are the, the cities in our country, like this, the Bay Area, like Austin, like Boston, they're just growing like wildfire. And so, and in fact, interestingly, the technical jobs that are coming into those particular cities generate five additional jobs. So that tech, you know, sort of biotech, like Anne's World, or the uh, the folks um, you know, in computer science are generating two white collar and three blue collar jobs. And those jobs are even higher paid than the same jobs in other regions. So how do we get more of that kind of uh, work, that those kinds of companies, those kinds of startups, as well as scale ups, as well as helping fabulous American country companies transition to next gen economy products so that those are happening you know, in St. Louis, in Omaha, in, in Alabama, you know, across our whole country. And I actually have an insight that one of the things that you see is that a lot of the talented people, those entrepreneurial people, they're actually in all those cities. They're just a little more of a minority. And so it's, it's a lot of connecting disconnected networks, getting people within cities to know each other. Detroit is such a fabulous example of that. Uh, and uh, the administration has been working closely with the leadership of Detroit. You see these emergent groups in Detroit. My, some of my favorite are you know, the greening of Detroit, so Detroit dirt and urban farming and you know, healthy food and those transitions in, in addition to core making and manufacturing that Detroit has always been known for. Well, you know, Megan, the theme of Most Powerful Women this year is the new connected leadership. So is there anything that this Most Powerful Women community, who you know very well, um, could do to kind of help you with your mission? Very much so. So I think along the lines of, you know, thinking about in this innovation nation, you know, how do we reach out, uh, not only in the cities where we're living, to different groups who aren't part of the innovation economy in a way they really could be? Americans are talented. And so if we just connect each other to these opportunities, we'll see people rise. So being part of that, that movement almost uh, would be really helpful, especially you were talking about mentorship. So a lot of this community has extraordinary skills, and it really gets down to brass tacks of, and, you know, for those new entrepreneurs, Steve Case and Gene Case have this great uh, program called Rise of the Rest. They're going around on buses, you know, from- What is it called, uh, Megan? What is it called? Rise of the Rest. Rise of the Rest? Yeah, the rest. It, comes, okay. it actually comes from okay. a book that was about other countries rising and us not, but they felt actually, let's take that language back and let's have it be about the rise, not only of these brain hubs I was talking about with Moretti, you know, Silicon Valley and Austin, but also the rise of all of the other parts of America. And so they've been going on buses. There's entrepreneurs again in all of those places, but there's just less of an ecosystem than you might find in Silicon Valley. So you don't have as many angel investors or mentors or others. So why not use the internet and the interconnections we can have cross city to help those first and second time entrepreneurs have those mentors and teammates as well as find others within their city locally to work with them. So something that the most powerful women's um, community can really be a part of. I also think in general, the lack of uh, women and, and minorities, uh, people of color in the tech fields, just the more we're already doing extraordinary amount, amount, but being visible and working on visibility, working on advancement programs, can, you know, reaching out to people 
all the things that we're doing, we just need to keep doing them, they're working. Megan, uh, how large is your organization that you are overseeing there or working with there? Right, it, it's, a, it's a great question because the, it's also, in some ways it reminds me of a little bit, you talked about me being on the MIT board, there's all sorts of different, almost academically, like working together with different departments, whether it's the Domestic Policy Council or the National Security Council, all these great teammates. So I think our team takes two forms. My specific team is that there's about 10, a dozen of us in Team CTO working on a whole range of pro projects, a lot of open government, a lot of government reform using tech and innovation, a lot of this kind of outreach to networks as well as, of course, technology policy with Spectrum and broadband, all, all those with the different agencies. Um, we are embedded in an extraordinary group, which I love, called Office of Science and Technology, Science, Technology and Policy, OSTP, which is uh, reports into the president's science advisor. So Dr. Holdren and I report to the president and we're as team CTO embedded in his organization. Uh, there are several groups there and interestingly, many of them, most of them are led by women. Um, so uh, Pat, who's leading the kind of more security technologies and all of that group, it's a group that's looking at energy and environment um, and climate change and those kinds of technologies. There's a team that's looking at all the science work, so they could be working anything from sort of planetary research or basic science, but also very much involved in the biosciences and of course Ebola right now, uh, challenges there. And then uh, a really extraordinary group run by Tom Clear is uh, technology and innovation for the brain, the brain, um, the brain initiative that launched last week. I don't know if people saw that, that came out of his group. So this is a group of about 70 people within the White House who are deeply knowledgeable about just about any topic in science, technology, innovation, and are able to work with all of the rest of the government and help with technology policy, um, advising on funding and other things, and really being the president's technology innovation team here. So it's a great home to be embedded with. Uh, Megan, as a mechanical engineer by uh, education and early training, um, I know that STEM, girls in STEM, is an incredibly important thing to you. Are you going to be able to work on that challenge, bringing more girls into STEM uh, in this CTO role? Yeah, definitely. Um, I'm working very closely with Joe Handelsman, who runs the science team, and she has great research about science and hands-on and active learning. Uh, within classrooms, just thousands of papers about why we need to shift to that. So working with the Department of Education to see how we can shift all of our classrooms, not just after school, to that. I just also came from a meeting with, uh, we call them the League of Innovators, Innovative Schools, um, who are here, amazing um, superintendents and others from across the country who have come to the White House today to collaborate with each other, who are doing great work within their local communities um, around connectivity and education advancement. One of my favorite is the a group in, in uh, rural Alabama who uh, let the kids take their computers home, they had a computer per kid, um, as long as they took one class. And 40% of the middle school took a summer class just to have that computer and passed all those, fabulous. Also, all kids who maintain a B average in that school are uh, allowed to have their first class at home uh, before they come to school. And so they're all big foreign language. And uh, they were saying that, you know, they don't, they can't afford different language teachers, Chinese teachers and others. And now they have kids in their schools taking any language class that they want. So really people who are getting it done at the local level and being able to bring them here to cross share with each other. And then for us to really highlight their work and then think about of the best of those, what belong, what of those ideas belong in all of our schools and how can we get the word out or set policy or work with colleagues at, from Ned or whoever that is or local and state levels to get these kinds of things to be available for all the American children. Was taking this job a no-brainer? Uh, it was a no-brainer. Um, at first I thought, move to DC, what, what? It, but uh, you know, as soon as I thought about it, I'm very service oriented. I'd love to use technology uh, to help people have better lives and to reduce our impact on the planet. And so to have the chance to uh, work with this extraordinary team, with the amazing you know, American people in the ways that we're interconnected with them and people around the world is an uh, incredible honor and, and a great opportunity. I'm looking forward to what we can get done. And I hope you guys will help. And what is the best advice that you got in moving to 3,000 miles to Washington and moving into a whole new universe? Um, I, I got a lot of great advice, but one of my favorite ones, which turns out to be true, was that uh, they said, you'll be surprised by how entrepreneurial people how are much, in government. I'm sorry, what? 
Entrepreneurial. Entrepreneurial. People are in government. And you don't, you think of government bureaucracy, but really this White House team, this president, this group, they really want to get things done. And they're thinking very creatively about that. And you can go across the agencies and you can find people. They're there. So we need to surface those people, get the solutions moving, and, uh, and move the agenda forward. Megan, um, you have been such a great mentor and such a great role model, most powerful woman over the last decade. And we really appreciate all the mentoring that you've done. And you've been extremely generous in um, helping young women, both in this country and um, globally, uh, through the uh, Global Mentoring Program. Um, and over the years, I know that you've given these young women a lot of career advice. Um, what's the best career advice that you would pass on to young people who want to be um, very successful leaders like you are and the women in this room? You know, overall, you know, my, my thinking about those incredible young people is, I always say people do things, you know, things don't just magically happen. And so I love working with them because it's the people with their ideas that have always made everything, whether it's commercial entrepreneurship, political entrepreneurship, social entrepreneurship, you know, great change. And especially when we look at internationally, um, people in their own country will change their own country. So how do we come up underneath them and help these amazing entrepreneurs that you, you guys do such a great job with Vital Voices in the State Department finding. So I've loved working with them and most entrepreneurs all around the world. I think advice-wise is to go for it. You know, I was lucky to take acoustics from Professor Bose, the speaker's guy, and he was amazing. And he left us with this advice that I always try to pass on, which is, you know, if you can find something you're really passionate about, jump on that. Because if you're passionate about it and you bring your talent, people who do that are unstoppable. And so if you do that, it's a great thing to do. And I always combine that with listening well and asking for help. You know, so listen to the feedback, especially on products so you can evolve them because almost most products need to pivot uh, to be great. Um, and so it's that combination of sort of going for it and listening and iterating. Maybe don't listen to naysayers too much, but uh, <laughs> yeah, listen to great advice. Okay, Megan Smith, congratulations on your new job and thank you. That was fun. And I think we're going to lunch now.